on Saturday by having the open day. And uh, this talk is in celebration of the Science Day on the 28th, which is the Science Day, Shivarama's birthday. So let me introduce Rohani as the professor at the Center for Higher Energy Finish at IAC Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Um, her early education was at IIT Mumbai, and her PhD was at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Rohini, Professor Rohini Bodbole joined TIFR as a uh, visiting fellow in 1979 and then was a faculty at the Department of Physics in Mumbai from 1982 to 1985. Then she joined in 95, she joined IAC CNET, Center for High Energy Physics, as a faculty and has been a professor there ever since. I'm so glad she's here. This is not her first, I think the second time she's coming here, 96 or 95. No, after that, in 15, I came. Okay. But giving a big talk in this hall for Okay. Okay. So I, I hope we don't have such a big interval again. Now, let me just quickly tell you about her work. Um, Professor Rohini Bodbole has worked on different aspects of the standard model and beyond the standard model. And her, and her work has had a lot of impact on the design and interpretation of the Large Hadron Collider results. More recently, um, she's been working on dark matter uh, models, uh, particle, astroparticle physics of dark matter and their interpretation. She is currently, yeah, that's sorry. Um, now, I will just quickly mention her honors, which is a very big list. Um, so, she is a member of all three science academies in India. She is also a member of the Science Academy of the Developing World. She is she has been awarded the French Order of Merit, and she has got the highest merit uh, recognition in our country because she got the Padma Sri in 2019. So, that's really a, it's a great honor to have her here. She has over 150 well-cited articles. And apart from this work, her work in science and particle physics, she also supports the work of women in science. And I, I think I, I relate to that even more because I, I know of her work, of her recent uh, um, a publication, a book, which is called Linda Bitti's Daughters, which is about women scientists. It came out just a couple of years ago. And that, oh, these have a tremendous impact on women in science, which is not a very large number, not as large as we would like it to be. So I think I'll stop here because I can keep going on and on. And I will let Rohini tell us about uh, dark matter and astroparticle physics. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you, Rohini. Thank you, Rohini. So, <clears throat> almost good evening, but good afternoon to all of you. Thanks, Mosumi, for that very flattering introduction. Uh, as I said, I first came to IIA here in 1996. Not just that, I was actually going to be a faculty in IIA. Oh, we missed you. <laughs> and instead, I moved to India Institute of Science from Mumbai. So that was really very close competition at that time. And at that time, of course, uh, there were uh, actually, I think the Institute has changed its uh, profile substantially. And, you know, it's taken on new parts of extragalactic astro astronomy, more, much more of that. And uh, there used to be some amount of particle physics and some amount of uh, non-accelerator particle physics as it were here. And that therefore in the early years in Bangalore, I had more of an interaction with the government. But now when I came today, I said that people I know, yes, still, are of course people like Jayant Murthy, whom I have known for a long time. But other than that, this has been people whom I have known as students. 
like Pia Ali, whom I taught in Indian Institute of Science, or Firoza, who is not present here, but whom I knew from my TIFR days. So it's more like I'm feeling my age. <laughs> but thanks for giving me this invitation. And I particularly am very happy to see all the younger faces in the audience because my talk actually is going to be directed at you people. And I hope uh, you find some lesson to take home from here. And I'm imagining, as I was told, that there are perhaps people on Zoom. So good evening, everybody. So I changed the title slightly. And that gives the feel, feeling of what I want to, more realistically, what I want to cover. So I want to talk about dark matter in general, but from a particle physicist perspective. And therefore, I will talk about things you know very well, simply because I have learned them only recently in the last 10, 15 years. But you guys will know perhaps much more about it. But you know, there's one thing that long time back somebody told me that whatever we have recently understood, we always like it to talk to people. <laughs> so I'll tell you what a particle physicist, why dark matter is important to particle physicists. And first, of course, what it is, what why is it important for particle physicists? And what are the different kind of possibilities that particle theorists and particle experimentalists can uh, provide? to shed any light on what it is. Apart from the fact that it's dark matter, I think there's very little we know about it. So that's what my whole uh, idea is going to be. And in case young students are interested, I wrote a very small uh, kind of uh, article in uh, physics news, uh, almost at the height of uh, COVID, beginning of COVID, not height, because uh, even though it's a March 2020 issue, it got released somewhat later. So I wrote it just at the beginning of the COVID. And this was that I had given for the IPA award uh, that I had received uh, for the best theoretical physics. So here, I'm really very pleased to be telling you about this. So as I said, I will actually begin by talking about the current frontiers of exploration in high energy physics. And then I will try to, and that the general world is, which I would uh, cover more, it's called going beyond the standard model, but I should have added two more words, standard model of particle physics, because there is also a standard model of cosmology. And these two subjects have had their standard models proved conclusively, both by the LHC and by the Planck experiment. I will talk about physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And then I will sort of give you my own summary of what is dark matter, what do we know about it, and then the next question is why the very existence poses a whole lot of questions to particle physicists. And then of course, last but not the least, how does one hunt for the dark matter knowing that it exists? And then particularly I will end in last maybe 10 minutes, what can one do at the Large Hadron Collider, which is LHC and the future colliders? As you can imagine, this last part is where I have actually been working. And since we all know dark matter is something everybody knew from long time back, personally, I have been working on it since 1990 or something like that. And as the situation has changed, what I thought I knew, what I thought can be done or what we all thought can be done, kept on changing. And what I will tell you is in the last 10 minutes is only some of the latest results we have got, which have at least made me very excited and also wanted to give you a feel as to when you know you hear words like, oh, the Large Hadron Collider cannot do anything anymore. It has done everything it could do. I just want to give you the glimpse of how complex the operations uh, of Large Hadron Collider at probing something can be. And right now, I think we have been able to make some almost conclusive statements about a very narrow region of uh, masses of the dark matter part. So that's what I'm going to hopefully end with. So let's see what happened. No? 
and I can move here, but. Huh, now it's moved. So, you know, elementary particle physics after, since beginning from my, you know, the first discovery of the electron by Mr. Thompson, it has come a long way. And today, in 2012, at least that is about 11 years back now, we said we know what the standard model of particle physics is. We know that the worldview of our world of particles, the fundamental elementary constituents of matter, these are quarks, the leptons. But it's not enough to know what the building blocks are. It's in also necessary to know how those building blocks are glued together. So what are the bricks and what is the mortar? And that is the first carrier bosons, which are W said, the gluons, and of course, the real guy, the as they call it, the real McCoy in the American language, the Higgs boson. So this is the fundamental particle physics as we know today. And when we say we know it today, which means that we have a complete mathematical computational description of the fundamental particles, their interactions, and it has been tested to an unprecedented degree of precision in the uh, experiment. So we know this to be the truth. But is there a world beyond this? That is the question. And even before I tell you this, you might say, okay, particle physicists form well, maybe, you know, there are maybe 20,000 particle physicists in a world of, you know, even India itself has 1 billion people. So why, why this area that 20,000 people have, you know, got, got busy with themselves, uh, busy themselves with for 20, uh, you know, 100 years or collectively maybe 100,000 people. Why this should be important for the billions of people? The point is that this is not addressed only if it happens at the heart of the matter. That is how the you know, protons are made up of quarks and so on and so forth. But something else that is important. That understanding, those laws of physics that we have uncovered in this exploration seem, I mean, obviously they work not just today and not just here, but they have been working since the beginning of the time, since the beginning of the universe. So what we know today and what we have learned today has a bearing to what happened all those billions of years ago. And it also has a bearing to what happens at the end of the universe today. And that is why these laws are important for all of us, all of us who want to study science, whose main dream is to understand the universe around us. So this form an invaluable part of what we want to understand as a curiosity. So they are of relevance to what happens on cosmological time scale and what happens at the astronomical distance scales. To this crowd, I don't have to explain what one parsec is. So I can happily say whatever I like and you will correct me. All right. So more important, and I think this is the part that is important, is that how did matter form? How did matter come into being? How did protons form themselves? This puzzle, at least the current theories we have, need us to know the basic laws of nuclear physics, the basic reaction rates of re re that happen in our laboratory, are the basic strengths of forces that the Large Hadron Collider measured in 2012. So that's why this is important. And you know, understanding all these questions, how, how, how do we understand the relative abundance of different elements in the universe, in the galaxies, in the stars, how did they get formed? And they require, of course, require astrophysics cosmology, but it also requires the knowledge of fundamental laws of particle physics. It has plugged in a lot of big holes that we had in our cosmological analysis. So that's why this is essential. So I personally like to think that particle physics finds itself in an extremely peculiar state. And this is the state for the last almost 11 years now. And I'm stealing actually the two lines from Tale of Two Cities. I don't know how many people have uh, read this book, 
but it's a very nice book and at least my generation if you wanted to learn to read english you went and read the one of such you know classics so it begins like this it's the best of the times it is the worst of the times now why is it the best of the times that is what i have written in blue we found the higgs boson we completely proved that the standard model of particle physics that has been developed over 100 years is perfect but at the same time in the last 10 year 10 to 12 years the large hadron collider has not given us even a glimpse of any new particles or interactions that lie beyond the standard now that why is that worst it is worst because the properties of the observed higgs boson from theoretical considerations already tell us that there must be some new particles there must be some new interactions we are not finding them so now it's like saying that i have an understanding but there are why this works there is some basic questions that are there that the theorists have asked and if those questions if our answers to those questions had to make sense we should have found some new particles and we haven't found it. so it's the best of the time and it is the worst of the times because we know that the picture is incomplete and that's on very you know aesthetic theoretical grounds and i'm not going to go into that because that takes me completely far apart my field but then it's under the very pragmatic reasons you can say this also you know this vague theoretical reasons you can say please forget about it. that's just again 20000 people who are worrying about some formulation and some theories and some mathematics and maybe someday we will understand it we can forget it. but there are some obvious things that we cannot understand in spite of the fact that the laws of particle physics have cosmic implications there are things in the universe con now let me come back to this later we don't understand those things so you know that is the point i mean ideally one would have said okay basta you have finished you have explained everything go home and start doing something else and that something else is actually what we have undertaken and that is the world of astro particle physics that moshumi used the word is because there are these cosmic puzzles which we think we should have the answers to in the framework of any fundamental theory of the fundamental constituents of nature but we don't have good answers and what are those questions so and this kind of correct connection between the laws of particle physics and the cosmic issues was actually began with the time of bethel who actually hans bethel i don't know how many of you know the name but hans bethel was a towering nuclear physicist who for clear understanding how the sun generates its energy and that understanding in terms of the rates of nuclear reactions that you measure on this earth okay so that was his very important contribution gamma i hope everybody knows the name if you don't then please go and google it i mean he was the father of you know who told us about the, uh, the possibility of uh, cosmic microwave background radiation which i'm sure all of you have heard the name of he was the one who told us that there could be something like a cosmic microwave background radiation and then of course there is another great big gentleman who passed away just two years ago and that's stephen byberg and these three people were the towering scientists who told particle physicists that you neglect cosmology at your peril because there are these puzzles and what are those puzzles the first and foremost is dark matter in the universe now we know for sure it exists in fact it got a nobel prize in 2019 that there is a whole lot of matter in the universe that simply does not shine then there are two more puzzles one is the matter antimatter uh, symmetry in the universe that the universe is made up of only matter and not just in our local universe you go up to the edges of the universe and you will still find that matter dominates over antimatter like hell number of baryons minus number of antibaryons divided by number of photons in the universe is 10 to the minus 7 and why number of photons is important because early universe contained only energy contained only photons so you should you should look at only the fractional number of new particles that you have produced and you look at that and you see that you have only produced baryons and not antibaryons because the difference is one part in 10 to the 7 
All right. And of course, the last but not the least, which we heard yesterday in a wonderful talk, that the universe seems to be accelerating. Unmute. Well, the Planck experiment made this wonderful measurement of cosmic mm -hmm. matter and radiation and told us that the contents of our periodic table of particles actually accounts only for less than 5% of the total matter in the universe. So, so much for saying that we have an understanding of what are the fundamental particles in the universe. We know they are there, but they form only 5%. I mean, nothing can make you feel more insignificant, you know. <laughs> but there is about 26.8% is this so-called dark matter. And then there is this 68.3% which seems to be dark energy. Dark energy, many of us begin to think that may have something to do with theories of quantum gravity. And therefore, particle physicists still feel that this is an area where particle physicists and cosmologists together perhaps can make some progress. But as I said, that's a different uh, topic in a different day. So what about dark matter? Our indications actually started from Lord Kelvin. I didn't realize that till I recently went and did, read an historical article. But the closest that we all know is Zwicky. In 1933, Zwicky kind of noticed that the then available measurements of velocities of galaxies, and then he found that these guys are moving too fast. If they are moving as fast as they are, their kinetic energy, real theorem requires that the kinetic energy should be same as the energy. Now, if this kinetic energy is too high, as high as the velocities are indicating, the visible mass simply does not provide enough potential energy. And that was the reason we said, okay, there is this Dunkala material, that matter. But I think not many people believed that idea at that time. And if you looked at the data, that becomes clear why. But Vera Rubin did these fantastic measurements of what are called now the rotation curves. That is the speed, the velocities of rotation of stars around the center of galaxies. She did this galaxy measurement. And as we know, you expect the stars which are further to, you know, uh, move slow. But watch, and this I'm not going to explain again to this crowd, to some other crowd, I would have explained why this happens. But this is really law of gravitation that if something is twice as further apart, then the balancing between the you know kinetic energy and the potential energy will tell me that the velocity should actually decrease as one over r root r. And therefore, if I increase the distance twice, the velocity should be half as much. So this is what the velocity should look like, right? Now, what Vera Rubin and her collaborator, the very painstaking measurements showed that the velocity is actually remained constant. Now, what that simply means that your estimate of what was m, m was changing as you increase the radius. That means more and more mass was being enthroned. This is simple Gauss's law. 
So M corresponds to the total mass that is enclosed in the inside the orbit. So that's very simple classical physics that we need to understand. So this is Vera Rubin's measurement, in fact. Okay. These were the earlier measurements of Babdick. And this is what for the first time people begin to realize that the velocity indeed are not going down, but seem to be constant over a distance of this is in the radius in arc minutes. This was a 1970 measurement, but a much better, better measurement came. And uh, this is now written in kiloparsecs, things that we can understand and relate more easily. So here you see that as you go away, 10 kiloparsecs, 20 kiloparsecs, 30 kiloparsecs, 40 kiloparsecs. If the visible matter that was all, if M was given by the visible matter, then you would have had this behavior. And what you are finding is this. And this way, behavior now needed measurements from different, different, uh, different ways. And I'm not going to go into that because, again, you people will know much more. And astronomical crowd will know much more how these measurements will be made. But indeed, this is shows that indeed, two things it shows and which we will remember, that roughly the velocities of all these objects are a few hundred kilometers. That's one thing. And secondly, on the kiloparsec distance scales, they seem to remain constant. Now, this was at the distance scales of kiloparsec, but at the distance scales of galaxy clusters. This came somewhere around 1995, 1996, the so-called bullet cluster. And what this shows you is a photograph of two clusters actually colliding. Okay. And what you see in red is an X-ray photograph. That means it's the visible. And what you see in blue is actually taken from gravitational lensing. That these clusters, the collision was actually eclipsing light from objects behind. So you could do gravitational lensing photograph. And now you see that this is the visible matter and there is this is the, the invisible dark matter. So this, in fact, was considered quite a death knell in the ideas of modified theories of gravity. We, you know, because this thing, you could still say, you don't know, Newton was wrong. Maybe I can change the, and it's a perfectly valid uh, uh, question that what you see here, why should it be true over kiloparsecs distances? So that was a completely valid uh, scientific approach, but it could not explain this. Modified theories of gravity cannot explain this. And the last but not the least came from the Planck measurements. And what did the, why did the Planck measurements have something to say about dark matter? It's a very complex story. It's an interplay between uh, cosmology and uh, astrophysics. But in very simply put, in a, again, a particle physicist's perspective, is that the early universe, uh, right after the inflation, would have been completely uniform. But there were quantum fluctuations in this. And these fluctuations provided the seeds for formation of structures. And those structures, how did they get formed? What was the potential well that attracted them? The idea is dark matter provided them the potential well in which the matter, so to say, fell. And it followed those, those fluctuations where matter, matter accreted because of dark matter, and that's where the structures got formed. So that's why this black body radiation, uh, the microwave background, background radiation, can give me existence of dark matter. But what is this telling you? That the dark matter existed at the beginning of the universe, at the time of the formation of the structure. And what is the distance scale there? It's gigaparsec, because that's how long the universe has lived. So we have a measurement at the kiloparsecs that was Vera Rubin. We have measurements at the megaparsec that was the bullet cluster. And we have measurements at the gigaparsec because of the limit of the observable universe, which is what this guy did. And now actually, apart from bullet clusters, a whole lot of wonderful gravitational lensing measurements have come up. And they really support the existence of the dark matter at uh, the megaparsec level. We can even, and we do have dark matter even on the Earth and the Sun, 
but I, you know, the mass is so little that uh, you're not going to, you know, the density is going to be much more higher in the center of the galaxy. So that's where you would hunt for it if you want to hunt for it in the asteroids. So, okay, what do we know? We know for sure it exists. In 1933, we are not sure that it exists, but over the years, since to, uh, from 2010 onwards, I think everybody is convinced it exists. Not only it exists, it forms a big part of the energy budget of the universe. This is now measured. See, again, just to give you an idea, when I started, we started looking at this, the total fraction of energy density in the dark matter, the limits were, it's 0.1 less than, uh, rho less than 0.3. So it was 0.2 plus minus 0.1. It was at that level of accuracy. As it has happened, the 0.2 has indeed remained that because it's 26.8%. So it's a pretty good that measurement was not so bad, but the error has really decreased. And I will give you on the next two slides what the error currently is. Then the dark matter velocities are about 200 kilometers per second. The direct experimental evidence exists only for the gravitational interaction, because where did you see it? The direct experimental evidence was this here. Direct experimental evidence, in some sense, this is not direct. This is where I use our idea about how simulations of galaxy formations and what are The direct evidence is this, the direct evidence is this. And these direct evidences are actually only telling you that it has gravitational interaction. I'm going to argue in the next few minutes that it needs to have some more interactions too. And that's where particle physicists will come into picture. But we'll come to that in a minute. It is electromagnetically neutral. That's why you cannot see it. And it has got to be stable on the scale of the time of the universe because it is. It was there at the beginning as Planck results told us. It is there today as uh, bullet cluster tells us. That means it has to live for billions of years. It's absolutely stable as the we are concerned. And as I said, this, pro this already I talked about that it provided the attraction to form our stars and galaxies and all the structures. So that is where its relationship with the cosmic microwave background radiation has come to play. Actually, if you look at this, and I'm sure you have, some of you at least have looked at it in the early universe formation. So we believe that in the Big Bang, when the universe was formed, there was this period of inflation. And after the inflation, as I said, there was a uniform uh, and a, you know, uh, uniformity in all the structure, but then started fluctuations and those then developed and then slowly uh, we formed uh, protons and neutrons and then the ideas came and formed stars and galaxies. And this entire evolution from here to here is only 100 seconds. So that is the famous first three minutes of uh, Weinberg. The first three minutes when the first matter was formed in the universe. And how, you know, when we start talking of dark matter, we have to use the ideas, the philosophies, the hypothesis about what that the cosmologists have given us, what happened in this period. Okay, so that's why dark matter is a cosmological object. Okay, this is just to tell you why this is. And we are sitting here, of course. And this dark matter, it must have been produced around the same time when proton neutrons were produced, obviously, somewhere around there. And then they have lived forever. So, what are the questions we would like to ask? How did it come into the existence in the early universe? The early universe was only ideas about understanding about how matter came into existence. And an analogous line, people tried to formulate how dark matter could have come into existence in the universe at all. So this is where the particle physicists begin their job, as it were. Okay. Then what are the properties of the universe which will decide how much was made? Because you know now it's 26.8%. And you believe that it lived forever, so it was made at 26.8% level, we assume, in the early universe. So what properties of the early universe, the history of the universe is important? That will decide how much is made. Whether it is 2% or 5%. I mean, for example, the, the typical ratios of... Uh, the lithium to deuterium and 
the lithium hydrogen ratios, all of them depend on the history of the universe. What was the cooling? What was the temperature? What was the rate at which it cooled? So on. But then you need the properties of the particles which existed in the early universe, obviously. And of course, as I said, formations of these structures. So there are two features. There is astrophysics and astronomy, which is really classical, and particle physics and cosmology, which is really quantum. And these two classical and quantum ideas have to come together for me to try and answer these questions. You know, Gamma famously said that it took, it took less than one hour to make the atoms, a few hundred million years to make the stars, but five million years to make the man. Actually, he said man, I would have said human. But... <laughs> And we are interested in that history, it's a very small part of the first hour. We are interested in the very early universe history. So as we all know, and it's, uh, at least we all believe to be true, because I think the ideas of what the early universe was itself have changed over centuries. And I'm not going to cover that uh, here. But there have been some completely what, what we think now are ridiculous ideas, you know, beginning from that the universe is made up of uh, turtles over turtles over turtles and all things. The human, human mind worried about it all the time. It's only now in the last hundred years that we have begun really to come to terms with what it can be. And as Einstein famously said, I find it completely, he said, and I'm just repeating, he said it's completely incomprehensible that this whole history is comprehensible to human mind at all. So, you know, we are given so what we know is that in the early life, the universe was all radiation. It was expanding. Anything that expands cools, basic thermodynamics. And slowly after cooling, baryons were formed and stars and galaxies. How did this happen? What happens is that the early, there, are, there is radiation. Radiation produces particles through basic particle physics processes. Two photons collide, they can produce an electron positron pair. Two photons collide, they can produce a quark and an anti quark pair. They can produce a pair of W plus and W minus. But this, when this universe is dense, this W plus W minus quickly annihilate and make up two photons again. That is when everything is in equilibrium. But if this was static, then it will remain in equilibrium forever. But it's not static, it's expanding. So as time goes along, a one W plus will not find another W minus to uh, make itself, you know, into uh, uh, photons again. So that W plus or that electron or that positron will then remain forever. Now the time, the temperature at which this will happen will depend, of course, on the mass. Because as long as there is enough energy to produce it, it will keep on being produced. Secondly, it will depend on the interaction rate of rate at which the electron and positron can come together to make two photons, correct? So this particular instant, when the electron, the backward reaction of an electron positron making a pair of photons happens less often than photons making E plus E minus, because photons can still find each other merrily and make E plus E minus. But the E plus E minus and four colors cannot find anybody to annihilate. So when that happens, then you say that particular particle species fell out of equilibrium. But once it falls out of equilibrium, that this is happening because the universe is expanding. It's also cool, like so not even if energy is being available. So there are two effects. So beyond that point, you say that the electrons have fallen out of equilibrium. And then you can calculate what should be the total number of electrons in the universe today relative to the number of photons. That's why we calculate everything relative to the number of photons. Because the number of photons we know by the temperature. So we can always normalize everything with respect to the number of photons. That's why you can see everything being coated to relative number of photons. So this particular uh, at temperature at which the particle species will fall out of thermal equilibrium. That is called the decoupling temperature. And after that, the, then the abundance of that species will remain unchanged. And as I said, it will be decided by particle physics. 
how many you know different reactions can happen in the annihilation that's what will be deciding this so these are then the relics left after the big bang and hence the word relic density you can calculate relic density about of any species if you like if you know its mass and if you know its interactions if you postulate some new particle that existed at those energies because there was enough the temperature that will contribute to the annihilation then of course it will change the density so the relic density is an object which a particle physicist with the help of cosmologists can actually calculate given the input that what are the particles and what are their interaction strengths okay so this is an object that a particle physicist can compute this relic density and this relic density is exactly what the planck experiment or the other experiments are measured so voila we have something that can be measured we have something that can be actually predicted and that's what we want to do to see whether our laws of particle physics that we have understood are somewhere close enough to give an understanding of this relative test is the basic qualitative idea clear okay so this is what i have said here that the expected relative density predictions in a given model will depend upon the theoretical understanding of the early universe of course and that is something that a particle physicist doesn't know much about but given those conditions by the cosmologists a particle physicist can actually provide the particle content of the early universe in his or her model and the interactions so this is really astro particle physics object you know you require cos astronomy and astrophysics to determine it and you didn't require cosmology and particle physics to understand it so there cannot be a more interesting object and in spite of the uh, tremendous progress in all the four branches we still are nowhere close to understanding what dark matter is so i think that at least convinces you that this is something that many of us have to plunge in headlong to try and understand because this is one of the greatest puzzles of the time that we have right now almost as good as the puzzle why the electron does not fall in a, in a nucleus in the early days of atomic physics i mean it's really that that is focused that all the laws quantum classical that we have learned none of the known laws and the known particles are able to explain this observed relative density so let me go on to that and tell you apart from you know apart from the you know fact that it exists we have no information to tell us what is its mass okay the point is that what we know is the total energy density now the number what i calculate what i can calculate uh, with the evolution is the number density relic that i was talking about is the number density but the total energy by the density means number times mass <laughs> but it's useless for me to be able to calculate the number density if i don't know what the mass is because the energy density is actually the combination of this and i already told you that the number density depends on the ma mass and the interaction so it's a complex non linear problem it's not as straight forward as i made it so the okay. for example in the theories of cosmology what is really light is a particle which would fall out of thermal equilibrium when the radiation in the early universe when the early universe is non relativistic that means you already want the particle should be non relativistic at the time it falls out of equilibrium that tells us something about its mass because the temperature etc are all you know complicated relationship with each other because you remember that expansion means that how, how the temperature changes with time is also given to us by dependent on the hubble constant and what have you so it's all a really a complicated relationship between all these constants what we do know is that the guy has to be non relativistic at the time it falls out of equilibrium and why do i need that need that because it has to provide the center for guys to fall in for the matter to fall in and form stars and that happened quite a long time afterwards that's why this any heavy guy will have to be non relativistic because it will if it was relativistic like a neutrino it will also fly apart no it will go away and there will be no structure formation 
So from the fact that we have structure foundation and from the requirement that the dark matter provided the seed, we know and the knowing the time at which the structure got formed, that the dark matter must be non-relativistic at the time it decided to stay, stay on forever in the universe. But if it has to be non-relativistic at that time, that then that tells you that it cannot be neutrinos because neutrinos are very, very light and they are relativistic even today. Okay? So therefore, they have to be heavy. And that is what is called a cold dark matter. It's cold because it happened at that particular instant when the temperatures had fallen down. And it was heavy at that time when the temperatures were high, uh, low enough. And that's why it was heavy and hence not interesting. And actually, to be honest, particle physicists loved it the day this was suggested by Kohl. In a, in this was actually put forward by Kohl called the Wimp miracle. And why did you do that? I'm going to show you one formula. This is the only formula I'm going to show you. But the reason it happened is that one knew, and this, as I said, that time when we got involved and when Kohl was making his ideas, this was known to be 0.2 plus minus 0.1. But in the intervening 30, 40 years, the measurement came to 0.120 plus minus 0 0.001. And H here is, by the way, Hubble's constant normalized to 100. So H by 100, the real Hubble's constant divided by 100. So take your favorite value of Hubble constant, this will change. But that's just not normalization, so it doesn't matter. Now, if I call this candidate as something called chi, as I said, that the energy density that you compute would be the fraction, the combination of the M, the number density, and the critical density that is required to close the universe. And if you look at that, this formula actually is a very simple looking formula. And what that, that tells you, and actually it's very amusing, that this expression almost doesn't depend on M separately. Okay, it depends only on the annihilation cross-section averaged over velocity, and V is the velocity of the dark matter candidates which are colliding with each other. The velocity will depend on the temperature at which this is happening. So at the decoupling temperature, whatever is the velocity, and that particular uh, average that you are taking, because it's a distribution given a temperature, so you have to take the average. So what, they, what decides the cross-section, annihilation cross-section? It is decided by the coupling of the dark matter particle. And that controls our elite density there. So now you understand. But what they decide, you know, where what do the couplings depend on? They depend on your more particle physics model. And combination, and what happens is that if I call that coupling G chi, a combination of G chi and M chi will actually always produce the right relic really, because what I need is just this. Sigma And now comes the point. In particle physics theories, there existed a ready-made candidate, dark matter candidate called lightest supersymmetric particle. I will come to that in the next few slides. But particle physics had been worrying about this lightest supersymmetric particle forever. That was way before dark matter came. They are thinking about supersymmetry for something else. As I said, I will spend a few minutes afterwards. But there exists actually in our theory such uh, ready-made particles. So in particle physics theory, there are, and both of them were beyond standard model. I already explained to you, neutrino could not be dark matter. So, and that was the only neutral particle in the entire standard model the framework, which was a matter particle. You don't expect photons to be dark matter particle. They are not. Everybody, else. do you expect gluons to be dark matter particle? No, because uh, people have worried about it, but they have a completely different set of interactions. And those interactions would have, you know, in terms of their, uh, you cannot have relic densities uh, for those guys because the strength of interaction that they have is very high. So it just does not get supported. So, there are, you have to have, so that is first thing. The existence of dark matter has told particle physicists that there must exist a new particle with a new interaction outside the framework of standard model. So that is why dark matter is so important to particle physics. 
because this is directly telling you that there is some physics beyond the standard model. There is some interaction and some part. So there are two candidates. One is this supersymmetric dark matter and the other one is something called axioms. I will not spend too much time on that because again, I, I am I'm going to talk about something that my heart tells me is that perhaps the truth, but that could be wrong. There are two good, very good, good reasons to expect either of these. I want to tell you here that particle physicists didn't postulate these particles to explain the dark matter. They postulated some theories, extensions of standard model to solve some intrinsic problems of the standard. Some theoretical issues about the standard. And then as it happened, in those extensions, these particles existed. And not just that they existed, they naturally had the couplings in the masses that would give you uh, annihilation cross-section of this variety, 10 to the minus 26. And remember the formula, it was 10 to the minus 27 divided by sigma annihilation V. So if I have a relic omega h, h cross square of the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, this aha, I am just in the right bulk call path, right? Because these are all order of magnitude things. So this was what was called WIMP miracle. That without doing any extra tunings to your model, a generic value for this cat's cross section for a supersymmetric dark matter is 10 to the minus 26 centimeters. Mm -hmm. this, that, that means there is a real possibility that there is some truth to this statement. That was what was felt. And that was this ideal candidate. Okay. As I said, theory does not tell us what the mass of this particle should be, but it tells us that it should be in the range of 10 to 1,000 G, 1 to 10,000 G. And then for that entire range, I told you, you can fool around with G chi and M chi. So it provided possibilities of giving the right relic density in the framework of a model without doing any fine tuning. And that's why particle physicists sort of really, you know, uh, felt that that might be the truth. As I said, they did not postulate these particles to explain the dark matter. They arose in theories which were postulated to handle some other theoretical shortcoming of the standard model. Unfortunately, what has happened is that not just these two particles, but also the associated new physics that these theories predict, new particle, additional new particles that these theories predict, People have looked for them and we have no evidence. That is the worst of the times part. The best of the times part is that we have, so again, the best of the times, we really know dark matter exists. We really have a nice candidates in our theories. But if those theories are true, not only that we should find directly this dark matter candidate in our labs, but secondly, even more importantly, if this is the truth, the associated new particles, associated new interactions. We should see evidence for them too in our collider experiments. That is the question, right? So I, you again see the best and the worst. So I myself got involved in this many years back because I am I'm a supersymmetric enthusiast. And this is a book we wrote, how to look for supersymmetry at the colliders. And in fact, we have one chapter on cosmology, and that corresponds to this entire story that I'm right now trying to tell. So this is the thing. And what has happened again is that the Large Hadron Collider has looked for supersymmetric particles and we haven't found it. It's a sort of now from now on, the story is going to be we haven't found it, we haven't found it. But that's what it is, and that's what I'm going to end the last 15 minutes of my talk. So I told you, you know, however well motivated, well motivated and however I like it, supersymmetry is just one model. Axions is just one model. Because those are models of physics beyond standard model that we are postulating. Uh, right now, as I said, we have no confirmed indication for the mass. And therefore, our ideas as to what a real dark matter candidate is, can really be. If it is WIMP, supersymmetry is a great candidate. 
If it is not a wind, if it is a very light, like 0.1 MeV, 0.2 MeV kind of a mass, then there has to be a completely different particle physics theory. There has to be a completely different model. And we don't know such, we, the fact that we don't know such models doesn't mean they don't exist. So now you see the enormity of the job. Okay. So what do we, what do we demand? What can we demand of a model? That any model that you put forward, you postulate, you should be, it should be able to give rise to the relic density, relic abundance that is in agreement with the measurements. So it should give rise to 26.8% of the total energy budget is in the dark matter. We have to be able to prove that, calculate that and achieve that number. And they depend, as I said, on the early cosmology and the properties of the dark matter candidate. And therefore, just what parameters of the dark matter decide this? The dark matter mass and the annihilation cross section. So, this is really what a particle physics modeler would like to do. And now, if it is in the framework of a very specific, nice model, then, as I said, there will be associated physics. And if you have not seen those associated physics, that will put constraints on your model. You will not be able to really move around on the parameters of the model till you get the right relic. Because you might be able to show that for these choices of the parameters of my model, I get exactly 26.8%. But then you will say, but shouldn't I not have seen at the LHC some evidence for such and such thing? Said, no, I haven't seen it. So therefore, a good theory builder has to actually now begin to look at these things in a comprehensive manner. You know, again, I want you to get an idea of the total, total global bigger picture that one has to look at to answer the question about what the dark matter is and what are its problems. As I said, how to decide which is the correct story, okay? That is the issue. So there is this very nice picture which a friend of mine prepared and I really like it. So I will spend some time on it. So one is at the colliders, which is where I come from. Standard model particles collide and they can produce the dark matter candidates. So produce the dark matter candidates in your collisions. What happened in the early universe? Reproduce the situations in your collider, prepare, make them. Then you have to worry how to detect them. And that I will come in a few minutes. So this is what a collider physicist do. Make the dark matter in your experiment. A uh, astronomer who goes into space will do something else. That's called indirect detection. Look at dark matter particles colliding and producing standard model particles. So go to places, look at places where you have dark matter density, go to the centers of galaxies, go to the center of the sun. There should be enough dark matter candidates, they should collide. Again, that happened in the early universe. And they will produce uh, standard model particles. They will produce electrons, muons. They will not produce heavier particles because their energies are not so high. 200 meters per second doesn't give them too much energy. But yes, this is one way you can do it. So that is called breaking. So you either go this way at a collider or you go this way in the space based experiments. There are some very nice space uh, projects. Fermi Light Experiment is one of them where you go and point your telescopes, whether they're space telescopes or whatever, into the regions where you expect there to be high density of dark matter. And that's Cepheid variable stars and so on and so forth. You do experiments with them. You look at the center of the galaxies. As it has happened from time to time, there have been uh, rumors that we have seen production of E plus E minus and mu plus mu minus beyond what is expected by astrophysics. And everybody has said, oh, maybe we have seen dark matter. You know, there is this unique line of 511 KeV line because electron and positron masses, uh, have, we know them very well. This could actually explain this. There is some pulsar nearby, which might actually be able to do it. So this is also happening. And the last but not the least is what is called shake it. That means take, a, take the dark matter current that's coming from outside, 
put a deep underground mine detector. Let it let the dark matter particle wobble with scattering the your uh, target, and you see the recoil motion of your neutron, for example, and measure it because this you cannot measure it. Anything the dark matter it doesn't interact, and everything you detect is through electromagnetic interactions. So then you ask the question, how do you detect this stupid dark matter, right? So now these are the three ways. And these are the three that there are. This is over. Oh, this is that now you know one of the top notch questions that the scientific world has. So of course the scientific world has built top notch high profile instruments. So there is this which is direct detection, which is shake it. So this is the collider one, make it, and this is the one that's breaking it. Okay. So these are the three different types of uh, experiments. So this I still want to spend some time because I am going to base my some of my conclusions on these results. So what do you do here? And this works right now. The experiments that are there works if the masses are in the range of ten to thousand times mass of the proton. So that's ten to thousand GeV because proton is roughly one thousand MeV, which is roughly one GeV by C. So what will happen is that you take a very heavy nuclear xenon, it will recoil, and then you will measure the recoil velocity. Just see what are the recoil energies: hundred kilo electrons. So a heavy nucleus like xenon, you want to measure a recoil of hundred keV. So it's a tremendously complicated experiment. You need tremendously concentrated sources of xenon. It's very expensive material, but you want xenon because if you want to measure such small signal of keV, either for you try to detect phonons or you try to detect uh, actual uh, recoil uh, velocity, it's a complicated beast, and you want to reduce the backgrounds. So xenon happens to be very stable and radioactively you also you know pu purify it so that you are safe. So that's why you want xenon. Now, what I, what I will show you in the next few slides is that people have been working on these experiments. The time when we started working on this in 1992, these experiments were there in infancy. So nobody trusted anything. And I will show you, I want to show you three slides, the kind of impact these experiments are now making on the entire phenomenology. So these experiments have taken, you know, 15 years to develop. So I just want to show you that. So this is a plot that, and what does this show? What they show is the weak nuclear cross section. That is, I told you the guy comes down here, right? The weak in, interacts with the nuclear, and you haven't seen any evidence. That's the first bottom line. So then, what do you do? You translate that to say, for a given mass of the beam, how high the cross section could have been. Because I have not seen it. So, what value of cross section has been ruled out? That's all that you can do right now, since you haven't seen it. So, what it showed is that as a function of the WIMP mass, it said that the WIMP nuclear cross section, for example, let's say at 30 GV, is this black line, central value, is less than four times or five times 10 to the minus 47 centimeters square. That is the limit. Now I go and do my calculation. I calculate the relic density for a particular point. It is 26.8%. And then I ask the question, what is the predicted dark matter detection cross-section for that density? If it is at 10 to the minus 46 square, centimeter square, my model is already ruled out. So now you see the strength of this kind of exclusion. Of course, we didn't want to have only exclusions. We wanted to have detection. We don't have the detection yet. And where the limits are bad are in this region where the experiments have no sensitivity. So that is something we knew beforehand. So now the, I will come to that maybe at the, after, this, then after two transferences. So this was the story in 2018. This was a very famous experiment called Xenon one ton. So this was one ton of Xenon. And they're eventually wanting to get 100 tons of xenon. Okay. 
But then there are other competitors. There is one competitor in China, okay, that's called Panda Eds. And there is yet another very new, that, that's on the next slide. So Panda didn't make too much impact compared to Xenon Vantan. It more or less, you know, here there are limits at 30 GV are more or less hugging each other. So that was fine. But then came this latest 2022. And what has happened here is that what I pointed out to you as Q times 10 to the minus 47 has now become 8 times 10 to the minus 48. So by one order of magnitude, this experiment in 26 days of observation has ruled out a wide swathe of cross sections. So it has basically construct, const restricted the theory space even further. I'm going to show you the real impacts on the theory space, but I want you to realize this particular, how one particular observation can drive. I mean, finally, physics is a science that is driven by observations. And I just want to give you that feel, how these observations are right now impacting the progress and the understanding of the dark matter in a very major way. So this is this, that the most stringent limit has been now put at 30 GV, the cross sections above 5.9 to 10 to the minus 48 centimeters square are ruled out at the 5 sigma. All right, so a very brief summary so far. We have no doubt that the dark matter exists. Current observation tell us for sure that it has to have gravitational interactions, but it also has to have some other interaction and we don't know what that is. Because otherwise it wouldn't exist today. All right. And therefore it allows for a wide range of possibilities for the properties of dark matter particles. Theorists, particle theorists have some very well motivated models as to what it can be. And these are required to solve other theoretical puzzles. They are not introduced to solve just this problem. I would like to insist on this. Because again, I'm saying it in so many words, because in popular uh, parlance, you know, if you have an astronomer or astrophysicist giving a talk, they would run down supersymmetry and say, hey, you are not even finding it. And you are uh, jumping up and down that it could be supersymmetry. But it's hard to deny the force of theoretical ideas. And therefore, you have to, you have to work very hard to, dis to prove that that is not the solution. That's also a worthwhile scientific exercise, and that is the one that I'm leading to at the, in the last few slides. So I want to tell you. So as I said, theories can be tested by comparison, by the predictions with the observation of the amount of the dark matter, the 62 to 8 percent rates of detection in experiments. What I showed you the plots, these plots. Evidence for the existence of the dark matter particles using colliders independent of these calculations. These are the three things that we would like to do. And I will give you the summary already that all the attempts, you know, we have been able to infer the existence and the amount of the dark matter from astroph astrophysics and cosmology. But any attempt to detect it in any terrestrial experiment are those in the space completely fit. So let's see what happens. So what do theories do? They make models for particle physics beyond a standard model. That they are doing anyway. Then they check if they have a viable dark matter candidate. What is meant by viable dark matter candidate? You should be able to predict the right relic density, the detection rates for the different possibilities of detection, and manifestation in collider experiments. All right. So this is sort of an example of this kind of exercise that experience theories do. And this is just to show you that I had shown you some exclusion. Xenon Vantan at that time was an experiment in future. But I'm just showing you different exclusion and these green regions, pink regions, where the different theories predictions for these cross sections. And then we told the experiment, please read this limit. Then we may, you might be able to probe this region of the parameter space of the supersymmetric standard models. That was the kind of idea. So, you know, when we build large hadron collider, particle physics community has thought that we will find the yields. But we had also thought that we will conquer these additional mountains, which were the baryon asymmetry in the universe and the dark matter. 
as it has happened today, after 11 years, after walking up to the Higgs peak, we have found, you know, in mountains, you always see from a distance, the three peaks grew close together. There is still further distance and we have not been able to go. And it is these peaks that we are trying to now conquer at the LHC. So, I think I have repeated essentially this. So let me leave this. I can only make one comment that at the larger run collider, some signals that we will predict will depend on the specific model for the dark matter. And some signals are more generic. I mean, that is any model of dark matter will have some signal. And some models, some signals will depend on what your model for dark matter is. So there is a wide variety of signals you would look at. The particular signals that I kind of looked at was uh, dependent on this, which is dependent on the model. So the dark matter particles actually don't leave any tracks in the detector. I already said that. I mean, it's dark. So their production actually has to be indicated by what is called the imbalance of momentum. Because momentum conservation is the rule that all of us know is cannot be broken. So you know, you know what you do is that you collide particle waves and exactly opposite each other. So the net momentum in all directions of the initial state is zero. So if you produce some particles and you measure the total momentum of all the produced particles that you see, and if the momentum is not balanced, then you say something got lost. And that last guy was the particle that your detectors could not detect. So this is actually well known. I mean, this is how you look for that traditionally for the last 15 years, or actually before that, for particles with the neutrinos are a prime example. They leave the detector. Okay? And how do you infer their evidence? You infer their existence by seeing that there is a momentum impact. And you have to do some tricks with that, some analysis, but this is the basic physics idea. So this is the basic idea. So now what is left at LHC is you see if there are new heavy particles which decay and which in their decay products have some dark matter particle, like the supersymmetric one, I call it the LSP or the chitrid. So if it is there, then there will be a momentum imbalance in the decay chain of uh, new particles that you have produced. So look for such events. And right now, LSC has not found it. So forget about this way of looking for dark matter. This was a classic way for looking for dark matter, but that has not worked. Then you look for the direct production of the brothers and sisters of the dark matter, which exists in a given model. They are not dark matter. They are visible matters. And they could be produced. And so far, they have not been seen. But we know that if they are dark brothers and sisters of the dark matter, the rates at which they will get produced is also low. Because their interaction strength is lower than the other uh, objects. So therefore, now you look for them. And then you choose, you are in the supersymmetric model parameter space, you choose a point. You calculate the estimated resident density. You calculate the uh, estimated direct detection production cross section. You calculate at what rate it should have been produced already at the LHC. And then you check against all the existing numbers and you see, is my point in that parameter space still allowed? Do you see this logic now? That you use the direct detection cross section, indirect detection cross sections, measurements of uh, uh, absence of new particles at the LHC colliders. You put all these together and then you try to see whether a particular point in your parameter space is still allowed so that it gives the right relative density. And then you say, now you tell your LHC experiment is friends, go and look under this lamppost. That is where you should look. If you say that if nothing is there, we have to agree that this candidate does not exist. And to me, that is the beauty of a particular well-defined model like supersymmetry that it has the possibility of even being ruled out. It might still be in a small range, but there is a way of trying to figure it out exactly whether this is true or not. And that's the beauty of this exercise. And last but not the least, is you are producing, you are producing millions of them 
can you use them? Because that's the real first part of the LHC that had, it had produced large number of Higgses. So in supersymmetry, a Higgs actually can decay into dark matter. And those are also invisible. So how do you measure a Higgs that is invisible decaying? So this is something we had pointed out in 2002 in a paper, which luckily the experiment was decided was a good idea. They used it. So now not just observation of brothers and sisters, but also the invisibility fraction of the Higgses that decay invisibly and not having been seen, that becomes an additional constraint. So we sort of played this game in this manner. And I have already explained this, so I don't need to say this. So we decided to play this game and we decided just to ask the question in this narrow range between 10, because we wanted the Higgs to decay into a pair of dark matter particles, so that put an upper limit on the Higgs, uh, the mass, a 62.5. So we decided to ex examine the range between 1 GV and 62.5 GV with a magnifying lens, lens uh, putting all these conditions. And lo and behold, this is what I already said, that how to light up the lamp post under which the LHC experimentalists can then hunt. That is what we wanted to do. This is something we did about 20 years ago, but this is not the new thing. So again, this also I have said, so I, I think I've been saying things even if they, I did not move the transparency, so it's okay. So what we found, and that is the thing now, my supersymmetric model is a multi-parameter, actually 10 parameter, 10 dimensional parameter space. I have projected it out only to a single parameter, namely the mass of the dark matter particle. That is just, that, that is the theoretical uh, uh, work that I have to put in. And what we find is that in this famous cross-section plots that I had shown you, all the xenon one ton, et cetera. So this is the cross-section printing times the, you know, the in the Coban system. And then these were the points that we analyzed and the blue points meant that they were satisfying all the experimental constraints till then. So we said, aha, these are the points that you can give to the LHC people and say, please look at them. And then came this famous LG experiment. And at least for one side of the branch, actually almost all the points that we had found were viable are ruled out. So as it is, you see, only these very small regions where the mass of the, the, the LSP is between 40 to 45 and between 60 to 65, only this narrow range was allowed. The remaining points do not give you the right relief density. They will predict the relief density that is orders of magnitude higher than what we see. So they are ruled out to begin with. So now in this particular model, in this particular region, only this small green thing is left up. But we know very sure that LZ right now has collected only 10 days, 26 days of data. When they collect 1,000 days of data, this is going to be ruled out. You know, but that just tells you how much work you have to do to say that a particular point in a model space is ruled out. And we have good understanding. I'm not going to explain to you why this happens. And here on the other hand, if I change the value of one parameter, sign of one parameter, in fact, what you find is completely different picture. And there are still many points that are still allowed. So you say, aha, this looks nice. So how do I, does it look? So, you know, in here also, the pale green points are before we implemented the current searches of the Large Hadron Collider that is real as of yesterday. Then the dark green points are the only ones that are left. So there is some points left in this narrow range and some points left in this narrow range. And then this is the lamppost that we tell people, experimentalists, that here, these around 45 GeV, there are points which are very light neutralinos which LHC can find in their next run or rule out. That, that to me gives a very nice feeling that one is able to make a statement. So there are two things that I want you to sort of say, point out here. 
it's not very easy to say that I have ruled out an explanation till you do something. And now we have done this only for this narrow range between 10 to 1 to 62. Now, is there some, what can I say from 62.5 GB onwards? Many of us, and not just us, many people are working on that. But that is the kind of work that's right now going on. And that just tells you that it requires large number of experimental effort in the direction of LHC, large amount of experimental effort in the direct detection context, and large amount of experimental efforts in the indirect direction context. And all these three things, somewhere we hope, in the decade or so, will give us an answer what the dark matter is. I have provided only one particular model. Provided that model because particle physicists believe in that model for other reasons. But it could be that we are all wrong. It could be that the reality is very different. And there are people, particle physicists, who have started, you know, this I have mentioned already. Yeah. That, you know, I have done only one example and I have tried to give you this picture, what this specific thing can do. But in reality, you know, there can be a super, dark matter can be supersymmetric partner of a neutron. And we don't know that. The models are very nice and none of them have been studied in detail. Again, one will have to do this kind of exercise again. And actually, this is a slide I've taken from my friend Hitoshi Murayama that if you really are completely agnostic about particle physics models, and you said, all I know is the dark matter physics, uh, dark matter mass, and the dark matter interactions. What values are allowed by the current data? Almost any value in this entire range is allowed. I have talked about this narrow range for the wind. But if I was complete, and this is when I'm agnostic about this, particle physics model. So I'm also trying to tell you what particle physics helps us in focusing our attention on. That's why I'm, well, what role particle physics plays. And this is the interaction, the cross section. And the predicted cross sections and the predicted masses consist in very over this wide range. So the dark matter phenomenology is not an easy job. And therefore, particle physics provides some context. And that's how you can then expand your studies, because then you can translate the particle physics studies into these more model independent uh, steps. So that's the moral of the story. So, you know, the quest continues. Thank you very much. Time for a few questions. Yeah. So, so if I uh, uh, then I mean, if, if I create this radical density, right? I mean, at the early universe, so you need to have those interactions of the particles with all of this, right? So, how do you estimate um, the radical density of dark matter? As I said, you really have to do this, you really have to do these calculations of. Uh, I, I mean, the, the expression that I gave you. Uh, okay, I mean, I. I, I mean, uh, for, like, uh, for a normal variant, we know we can. Yeah, but it is, it is the same. Energy it is dark energy, no. I'm not even uttering the word about dark energy. Because I don't think that there is any calculation of. Because dark energy is different. Dark energy is. Here, when you calculate relic density, you are merely calculating number densities. So you are really solving Boltzmann equations. That's all. And therefore, all you are doing is you are cal calculating the forward reaction, the backward reaction, and then try to calculate at what point solve the equation for equilibrium uh, story and see where it will fall out of a chemical equilibrium. So that is just sure, clearly solving only Boltzmann equation. Nothing more. So it is... It goes exactly on the same lines uh, as any gas uh, that you will treat. And uh, there are collisions happening in the forward and uh, backward direction. In, it, I mean, you go back and look at it in the velocity space. When we do our uh, thermodynamics of gases, 
when we say that from one velocity bin, the forward collisions will take the particles into another velocity bin. The backward collisions will, like, that's how we calculate the equilibrium distribution, which is Maxwell, either Maxwell Boltzmann or uh, depending on uh, which, uh, if you take the spin into account, you will get either Maxwell Boltzmann or you will get uh, uh, the Fermi and uh, Dirac. Okay. So uh, the, that is the kind of thing. So the logic here is simply transport equations. You're solving simple transport equations. And there will be coupled transport equations. Because a gamma gamma produces a E plus E minus. Gamma gamma produces, let's say, a WW. But the Ws might be decaying and producing an electron. So the electron number density may depend on the, the W density. W density will depend on the W mass. This is just kind of giving an example. So you write down the equations, basically the, the number density equations for all these quantities. And each equation will be controlled by a different cross-section. And you solve. And depending on the masses and the strengths of the interaction, solving these is a, these are basically collision equations and nothing more. But you have to take into account that the temperature is changing. And that temperature changes because of the expansion gets translated into the time dependence. So that you have to feed in. It's, it's, it's reasonably complex. Uh, so we just calculate uh, uh, the value for visible metal and dark metal and assign the rest part to... No, no. In the relative density calculation, we don't know anything about that. Relative density calculations are for particles, matter and dark matter. Relative density calculation that cannot take into account the energy. Energy gets in taken into account only in Einstein's equation. So only from the expansion and the curvature. So the evolution of particle densities, that is matter, and space expansion or curvature is what is related to uh, dark energy. So dark energy has no connection with these calculations. It's only radiation and matter that are coupled, right? So dark energy is a different beast. In Einstein's equation, we have two quantities. One is matter and one is radiation. And then there is an extra constant, which is dark energy. Have I explained to you clearly? Dark energy has nothing to do with this. It does not evolve with time like this. The whole point is that matter evolves with time. And there is some finite amount of matter that got created when it fell out of equilibrium. That is why as the universe is expanding, right now the theory is that the matter is losing its importance. See, earlier it was radiation dominated era. Right now we are still in the matter dominated era, just above when they are equal. And slowly we are going to go into an era where we are actually going to be dominated by dark energy. If the presently understood expansion of the universe which is accelerated is Correct. So that is a dark energy is a different, different beast altogether. I mean, our understanding of dark matter is not going to help us understand what dark energy is. I believe dark energy is really related to the early universe and what we do not understand about quantum gravity, which has nothing to do with any of this because that's really related to the space-time curvature and the, and the development, the evolution of the space-time curvature itself which as you would agree is different than what we are talking here. This is just the balance between radiation and matter that we are talking. Is that okay? So, any more questions? There are some questions in the YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so, Rohi, there are two questions. One by Shomya from Shane Gupta who is asking, can the gravitational wave detector help to detect the dark matter? It's a very good question. And actually, there are sort of, you know, in certain ranges of dark matter masses, this could actually, people have been talking about how to make this possible. And it depends on, again, that, that is where my last, that's why I showed those last two slides that once you move yourself out of this somewhat constrained picture of WIMP, then as long as you are within the allowed range of masses and allowed range of interaction strengths, 
you can do anything and indeed people and people are taking this kind of very agnostic point of view let me see what i have can i use it somehow and most of the times we are putting constraints for example you know simple thing like loss of uh, energy loss by neutron stars even that can put constraints on if if it was happening due to dark matter cooling of neutron stars people are suggesting all kinds of very interesting things now because we are not finding it anywhere people are suggesting all kinds of uh, possibilities of looking for uh, dark matter effects and that can as i said that can make literally that can make for a very big different discussion i just wanted to focus on lhc so i chose this particular corner but he is right i mean there are such suggestions there is another question but probably you have already answered it by akham mirave who uh, who asks what is the role of the dark matter in the universe the role i think i tried to mention that the dark matter in the universe pro provided the seed for structures that is the role i mean that is an undeniable proof that it exists the fact that the structures exist means that those potentials will exist so i guess that is as much as uh, one can say they they help the it's like nucleation center for those fluctuations to grow yeah so as i said it's a very rough analogy but you can give that uh, analogy okay so before uh, uh, i think we have any more questions okay uh, okay so still some more questions <laughs> So the standard model has some force carrying particles. Is there any question of dark matter being a force carrying particle? Okay. You know, in the multitude of dark matter models, there are some models. Okay, uh, but they are not very preferred. I mean, what is meant by force carrier is the force carrier has to be a spin zero or a spin one particle. Okay. and right now most of the limits that we have got from the dark matter detection kind of are very steep when the dark matter particle has a spin zero or spin one so but that is just a, again maybe we are not intelligent enough to think but there are actually seriously lots of people who i mean you you have asked a good question on a very general ground but there are people who try to build models where uh, this might but you know there is a famous uh, 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 it's not in the natural sense of force carrier but uh, uh, self interacting dark matter so the self interact dark matter is more or less similar to what you are saying and that uh, actually see these things have implications for structure formation for galaxy formations so people have done numerical simulations by putting these in in the galaxy uh, simulations and then you find there are actually lots of issues about standard dark matter simulations where you do not you find in reality many more voids than your simulations uh, produce so then people have tried to say that if i introduce a scalar dark matter which could be so to say a force carrier then i will fill up those voids but then if you do that you have to try to compare and contrast it with the predictions of the direct dark matter detection experiments and those big exclusions that i showed you so it's a tight rope walk you put the tarpaulin down here you know it comes up somewhere else but that doesn't mean that people are not exploring it it's a good question okay okay one last question sir it seems that like the dark matter has some mass so we uh, think about it interaction with heat speed I, as a matter of fact, it is the interaction with the Higgs fields that will make the Higgs decay into two dark matter particles. The interaction gets. Yeah, but the point is that the mass of the dark matter particle is not due to its interaction with the Higgs field. Okay, it's 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 a funny thing actually. Not all the mass in the world comes from interactions with the Higgs field. Basic part. No, even in a proton, a large fraction of its mass actually comes from the interactions of the gluons. the interaction of uh, elementary particles exactly now the interaction of the elementary particles you are quite right that the interaction of the elementary particles along with the x field is what we 
we say gives them the mass. The, what I would like to actually put, that's a very colloquial way of saying it, but uh, that is just to say that, that in the world of uh, uh, world, we do not understand why elementary particles can have masses and still the gauge interactions can have the symmetries that they can have. Now with the dark matter particle, we are not required to have them the gauge symmetries, all the gauge symmetries, because they do not necessarily have all the strong, all the interactions. Their interactions need not be gauge interactions. So the masses that the dark matter particles have need not be generated by a Higgs mechanism. They could be generated by something else altogether. They can be generated by something else altogether. That's why, but that still does not mean that it wouldn't have interactions with the Higgs boson. It just would mean that that interaction doesn't give it the mass. See, a particle can have interactions with the Higgs boson, but that doesn't mean that the Higgs boson will give its mass because for that, that interaction has to be operative at the instant when spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. And that, that will not happen in the case of the dark matter particle with its masses and with the interactions it has. It's a slightly, I know I've not given you completely clear answer for the Higgs boson to have interactions with the dark matter particle and not still receive its mass from the Higgs mechanism. That is a fair enough answer, I think, and a correct enough answer. But more than that, I'm not able to simplify it further at this moment. Because I also don't know how much you know about the details of Higgs mechanism or about the production of masses. Okay, so we'll thank Rohini now before I present her this book. So we'll just... then I, I'd like to give you... Oh, I get something. Oh, nice. <laughs> Uh, so yeah. this is the book. Ah, how nice. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Can you hold this? Please ask it. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Ah, this is a wonderful book. It's about all the women astronomers in IA. How nice. And this is a picture of our telescope. Ah, how nice. That's what, it has been my dream to go and go and visit there, but I never did. Many times, we even were supposed to have a meeting of the DST PSC. <laughs> Very nicely done. Oh, wonderful. So, thank you again. Thank you. You're welcome. And this is also wonderful. Thank you. So, thanks again for staying.